going to mute here. Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we are going through Dante's Divine Comedy and we are currently in Purgatory. Uh, we're going to, so today's format is that everybody who has read will be, uh, you know, read, read the chapters, will be first invited to talk about their takes on the chapter. We're kind of in the middle of kind of, a, you know, close to halfway point. So if you have comments about Dante in general, your reading so far, this is a good time to share those. All right. Uh, we are hoping to get Rosella, who has been teaching Dante for the past 30 years, who has read, she says, I've read it only 300 times and I still get new things when I, so I'm hoping that she's going to uh, come in. She's planning to come in at 5.30 to give us her take on purgatory. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, Doug. Um, Phil uh, could not make it today. Um, it's his daughter's birthday. So um, we're going to start with Doug and then I'm gonna invite anybody who wishes to share, to share what they have gotten from this particular reading and what they're getting from reading of Divine Comedy. All right, with that, Doug, floor is, floor is all yours. Okay, uh, I just wanted to touch on a, on a few things. Some of them are um, come out of my own background. I work in theater and I did a play on Buckminster Fuller, which is where I met C.J. Fernley. Uh, because that play played in various areas and he was involved in support things. And it turns out we both had read Dante about 15 years ago and we wanted to reread it this year. And then it turned out Srikant was interested in that and Phil had read it before taking three years to read it rather than a year. And so I come at it kind of from theater. And so I keep finding myself seeing how Dante has staged the physical action of the play and the movement of the pilgrim walking on a certain journey and then certain little mini segments where crowds sweep in noisily, much like they do in a Fellini film and then sweep out. And, uh, and, uh, and so the movement of the piece keeps striking me as more and more relevant. And uh, I found myself a couple of days ago while I was trying to take notes, realizing there's certain problems in reading Dante in English as opposed to Italian. I mean, if you just take the title of Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, there's already a rhyme scream in the titles which don't really work in English unless you even the hidden rhymes or partial rhymes. Like, I mean, maybe if you named it Punishment, Purgation, and paradise, I mean, those are kind of English words that are sort of like, there's a lot of punishment, then there's a purgation of what's been impacted. And then there's, uh, uh, and so I began coming up with a lot of strange titles, which I won't go into now to say, you know, if this were really gonna be translated into Anglo-Saxon English, what would it be? And it would probably be much more brutal and aggressive and colloquial like Dante's Italian than, than what we get. Although there is a new translation I need to explore that may tap into that. Um, but the movement of the piece, I found I wanted to talk about this Buckminster Fuller actually had six principles of movement. And they had to do with expansion and contraction. And they had to do with inside and outside. And they had to do with orbital rotations, axial rotations, orbital rotations. And all of those things show up in Dante where people circle things, circling down to the deepest pit of hell then climbing out and then circling up the mountain to a point. Uh, and all of this stuff but these go beyond Buckminster Fuller or Dante. Into uh, Doug, ju just for reference for everybody, can you uh, list the six movements of uh, Bucky? Yeah, if they come at the top of my head, uh, they come in oppositions kind of much like in Dante, expansion, contraction, outside, inside, like taking a glove, a rubber glove that's a right-hand glove, and you turn it inside out, it becomes a left-hand glove. So there are oppositions. There's axial rotation. There's orbital rotation, like around something. 
And then if you go around something while you're on an axial rotation, you actually called that dance. You know, so if you're spinning like a top and circling another object of attraction, he called that dance. He also said, we don't fall in love because that would be a collision. We circle the thing we're attracted to. And so a lot of these principles of love, love is very important in, uh, in Bucky Fuller's work. And it's essential at this point that we just read, the center, the center of the whole divine comedy is really about love. I mean, he goes into these extended definitions of love and love that's too weak or love that's too strong. And there are vices if the love doesn't have the right balance, uh, which is sort of what Bucky's saying, that if you fall in love, it's a collision. You go to the object of attraction and you collide and explode. So more normally we circle what we're attracted to. And Dante certainly does that. Uh, he circles Dante and Beatrice for his whole life. And so there's also there's also torque, you know, twisting, which I think some of the tortures here have that sort of torque element. Uh, there's also precession, which the way Bucky defines it, that, that it's like a gyroscope. If you hit the top of a gyroscope, it goes to the right or the left. It doesn't go in the direction you hit it. So there's an unpredictable 90 degree angle effect. And Dante in the section we just read actually talks about the bee and the drive to make honey. And Bucky said, yeah, that's the intention. The bee is going for the nectar and he's making honey. But there's a precessional 90 degree angle effect that the bee is unaware of, that he's having another impact because the bee is also gathering pollen, which he's then taking to other flowers. So he's helping fertilize the whole process. But that's a 90 degree angle effect that the bee is unaware of. It's separate from its line of intention. So the vortexes of what people are intending to do and what they really do, and that's something that I think Dante plays with too. So those I think are the six principles, the rotations and orbits and uh, expansion, contraction. Thank you, thank you. But I wanted to go into Michael Chekhov's work. Michael Chekhov is a very, in the theater world and in the dance world actually, it's almost more important in the dance world than in the theater world was a Russian acting teacher who had to escape Russia. If he'd stayed in Russia, he probably would have been imprisoned or executed because he was very much a mystic. He had a nervous breakdown. He was one of Stanislavski's best acting students. And he had a nervous breakdown. He kind of built himself back into, by going into Eastern philosophy. And I think he was into Rudolf Steiner's ideas and very many different things. And I realize many of his principles are, I've realized this for years, they're very similar to Bucky's because he focuses a lot on expansion and contraction. That we move out towards something we're attracted to, we're repelled, repelled by something uh, we fear. And, uh, and so that approach, and then there are all kinds of other movement elements. He talks a lot about atmospheres, like an atmosphere of a funeral may be very serious. But an individual may have an impulse to laugh in the middle of a funeral. So the individual isn't always in alignment with the atmosphere of the room. And in Dante, there are often these atmospheres of very black, acrid, vicious clouds. And the pilgrims move through these atmospheres. And then suddenly an angel appears and there's a whole different atmosphere, a whole different energy. And Michael Chekhov used to focus on that. The thing about Michael Chekhov is he escaped. He came to Hollywood. He became a famous acting teacher in the 30, late 30s, 40s. He had to get out of Russia. Uh, and he actually trained um, Yul Brenner, who played the King and I. I'm dating myself here, all these actors I grew up. Jack Palance, who was, was one of his students. And his most famous student, who's usually credited claimed by Lee Strasberg, a very famous acting, was Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe brings an atmosphere that doesn't date. I mean, her qualities of performance, I mean, all these great actors next to her look almost mediocre. And she was apparently one of Michael Chekhov's better students. Uh, and so the energy that she could bring to the screen, which very few actors, uh, could kind of equal her is, is a very interesting quality. Now, 
What Michael Chekhov and another 19th century acting teacher said is that Del Sartre actually said that acting is a combination of forces. You're attracted to something, you're afraid of something, or you're neutral. You don't know whether to be attracted or to run away. And that's the period where you're sort of looking at it. And those psychological states of being, and that those are continually repeated through purgatory. So there are things called the whip and the rain. And I think the spur is a better thing. What spurs you into action? What's a natural attraction that you can't avoid? You're just drawn to somebody or something for good or bad. And then what do you do with that energy of attraction or repulsion? And so the things that, so there are these alternating rhythms led by Mary, you know, they mentioned Mary and that's the attraction because everybody has a positive reaction to Mary and then other good examples and those open your sense of what you can do with your life. And then they throw usually two or three, often three examples that really shake you up and make you afraid. So this mixture of love and fear runs through a lot of mystical traditions, whether in the East or the West, you know, so what opens you? So with Tai Chi, I mean, even now, if you just, and, and there's this gesture in it where somebody opens their arms to somebody. And that's an, a real basic Tai Chi Qigong exercise. Even there, as you're sitting, if you sort of open your arms as if you're going to give somebody a hug, they sort of say it's hard to be angry when you're in that physical position of openness, you know, versus collapsing and crutching and fearful. And so Michael Chekhov does these exercises of people being totally open and expanding like a big X or being closed and frozen and locked and then being more neutral and relaxed. And this actually pops up in Rumi too, where Rumi has a poem where he says, if a, if a hand is always open or always closed, it's paralyzed. So a healthy hand opens and closed. It gives, it takes. It you know, goes out to reach the world, it withdraws from the world. So the hand that is always closed or always open is paralyzed. So there's this breathing. And so all the mystics all over the world kind of deal with these basic gestural elements. Um, and I think they they're really help when you look at the blocking of Dante. And I think I sort of uh, like to stop there. I think this movement of how these crowds rush to somebody who casts a shadow, that's not normal. So they rush to find out why does he have a shadow? He's still alive. And then, or they may withdraw in fear and they don't want to talk. You know, there are different reactions of attraction and repulsion. But the purgatory uses those to teach spiritual progress by examples that open you up and make you feel good and then things that make you afraid and it alternates them. So there's a breath to the way it uses what I'd call a spur to action rather than a whip to action because a whip has associations of punishment. So I think the spur to action is a better thing and then the reining in. So whether you're sort of telling your horse to giddy up or whether you're saying, whoa, that's the other thing that I think is part of Dante. So I'll wrap it up there. I think that's enough to absorb. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. I really like what you're doing uh, you know, throughout this entire series, where you're kind of taking your experience of acting and theater, and you're showing how Dante is carrying the same kind of things. And you're giving a separate vocabulary, like the movement vocabulary, and mapping it on uh, to Dante. Wonderful. So folks, uh, if you have comments, go ahead and type exclamation mark. It's going to be Maxine, Ginny, Joe, Vanessa, Elena, and Allison next. Maxine, you can go ahead and talk about, you can respond to what um, Doug said, uh, any of you, or you can go ahead and talk about your own take on purgatory or Dante in general. Maxine, go ahead. Are you talking about the, the Chekhov that wrote The Doll's House or um, uh, he wrote Uncle Vanya? Uh, no, uh, it was his nephew. Um, uh -huh. Michael Chekhov was Anton Chekhov's nephew. And, uh -huh. 
So uh -huh. he was the playwright's yeah. nephew. Who, okay. All and right. Anton Chekhov died fairly young. He was in his 40s, I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Now You can actually uh, see Michael Chekhov acting. I, I don't know if it's a Hitchcock film. He plays a psychiatrist in a movie with Cary Grant. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the name of it. I'll find it while we're meeting. And oh, yeah. Ibsen. Right. plays a very quirky psychoanalyst in this mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood movie. Thank okay. you. Next one. Uh, uh, this is yeah thank what? you um th th actually th th that was my question you know was uh michael chekhov related to anton okay. chekhov that's what i was thinking right, the whole right. time yeah. yeah um thank you for letting me know that uh sure uh, i i know this is like a slight change of uh, uh are, are we are you doing this meeting every sunday or oh, no, no, no. don't 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 bring up other topics those you can go ahead and uh you can uh, I, if you're doing this uh, once a month oh, uh, month. Month. oh okay yes oh okay that's sad. Uh, okay thank you, thank you. Uh, okay um, so uh, may i finish please please, please. go okay. ahead um so um lee strasberg's class i was in for 10 years and i sat uh, next to marilyn monroe now she was the one are you kidding me <laughs> You. Are you serious? Yes, yes. Of course, that will date me, but we won't discuss that. But she was a terrible actress, but she was so sick that in anything she did looked good because she was sick. Everybody in that class was famous, but sick. They used to lay in a ball wrapped up in a corner. And when it was their turn to, to act in something, a scene, I mean, it, it was unbelievable. Of course, Lee Strasberg loved her because she was beautiful. And he would pat her on the shoulder and say, oh, darling, this is lovely. But it wasn't. She couldn't act at all. So don't think that it. it and I, I, uh, I attribute that to um, Dante because I feel he was so sick. I mean, and his uh, life revolved around a circle, but he had the uh, love, that unrequited love, and, and he had the ugly love. That was probably his wife. And he had uh, all these things. I mean, he was just as sick as Marilyn Monroe. So I would say, I mean, even when she went to do a movie, they couldn't get her to the set because she was so depressed and introverted that you couldn't get her there. Well, I would like to know, how did Dante die? Did he commit suicide? Or, I mean, how, how did he die? It's, uh, I mean, and what, he had children, what happened to them? How did they grow up? I mean, he, it was a very interesting, if you keep reading this work, you will absolutely, it reveals so much of his inner soul. Thank you. Um, Doug, do you know how uh, Dante died? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. Right. Know we'll, that. We'll, we'll, we'll get the answer to that for you, and it should be there on on uh, our friend Google. Um, we will yeah. we'll go ahead and look look that up. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Joe, Vanessa, Elena, and Allison. Joe. Um, okay, so maybe just to, a little bit of context of maybe the distinction between. Uh, inferno and purgatory is probably a good idea just to just talk about that for a minute and the directionality that even Doug was talking about is you know the different distinction is they keep going lower in hell and they keep ascending in purgatory and you kind of get this feeling as you see uh, as you're when you're reading it that you're actually ascending with the character with Dante himself and with Virgil, the other idea, the other thing was in, in hell, they're always turning left versus in purgatory, they're always turning right. They're always ascending. Um, the difficulty in the journey itself 
is actually it gets harder and harder as you go further into hell, but it actually it gets much easier in purgatory. So these are just some of the nuances that actually have been able to be incorporated that we've discussed here in the past, but it's good to have a setting as well. Um, when, when we're talking about Dante as well, as there's also the idea of time and purgatory that's very important. Um, in hell, time is frozen, everything is standing still, you're not going anywhere. Whereas time in purgatory is you're just being cleansed of your sins. So you're gradually moving up and there's a, there's a natural hope that is actually uh, that you start to feel with while reading this. Uh, there's also things like the most notable thing that I actually have noticed is how it, just how intricate this is written based on the music. Um, uh, so, you know, the things like uh, Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit, the Agnes Day, they're actually lined with each terrace in the Seven Deadly Sins. And you can see even roots of the Catholic Mass and how that aligns to the actual writing itself. The, in, the, most, the most important thing that I had taken away from this past uh, um, uh, reading of these cantos uh, specifically had to do with how the cantos themselves are set up. Now it's the seven deadly sins, we all know that, and how people are being purged of their sins. But specifically, the relationship between these things. So he has a conversation of, uh, with uh, Sapia of Sophia, right? Or sent Sienna, Sophia. Sienna, I'm sorry. And it, it's, an, it's a fascinating conversation because what you kind of see out of this is that she takes more pleasure in her enemy's pain than she does in her own personal success. And when you start to think about it, and this is and this is at the uh, uh, the second terrorist, which is uh, it's uh, it's not pride. Uh, it goes from pride to goes to wrath after that. It goes from envy. Sorry, um, forgive me. Um, so that this is an envy, and what envy does is actually kind of creates. It leads into wrath leads into anger how and he sets that up very nicely how or can because you have a contempt for people as opposed to an appreciation for them and this relationship is how you know you gradually you're going through these steps you can kind of see where these sins like where where they actually begin to tear us apart but then something Doug had talked about already was the idea of love within the context of that and how the absence of love in, in, in these kinds of, uh, in these uh, terraces and what, what's missing in your life is being able to appreciate everybody else. So one of the examples that was, uh, was uh, kind of given is that once you once you're incapable of uh, uh, or the Virgil gives is that specifically that your love for one of the things in heaven is that everybody's rejoicing when everybody else is doing well like the angels are happy and they're they're actually happy when you make it to the next level they're wiping away a P each time they're they're everybody's rejoicing because everybody else is doing well whereas in a fallen world, in, the, in hell, uh, and with with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, Sapia specifically, that and this is what stuck out to me, is that you have this element of um, of uh, you know that that there's this constant. Uh, I don't have enough. Where it, it, it essentially everything is is about themselves and misdirected love which actually is the difference between a fallen world and a and uh, something like heaven um i'm trying to really kind of uh gather some of my notes here there's also an, a, a discussion based on free will 
in these cantos as well. That's kind of important too, uh, where there was a, uh, in I think Canto 16 with Marco Lombardo, there's a discussion about how the city states are failing and that these city states uh, are essentially, you know, the results of people's decisions and that they have the choice whether to do things are right or wrong. And, and that there's this failure of ethics that, have, that has continued to happen over a long period of time. And then uh, I'm trying to summarize some of my, I didn't expect to even get talk this long, um, but uh, I actually have a couple more comments, but uh, I'm gonna withhold them for now. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, I have some other things that I just have to collect sure. the sloth. Yeah, I'll come back to it. Thanks. Uh, next up is Vanessa, Elena, and Allison. Vanessa, what are you getting from your reading of uh, Purgatory? Well, first I gotta begin. Uh, thanks, Joe. I feel like the preschooler following the doctoral student giving his thesis. Um, now, full confession here. Uh, um, I hadn't read the beginning of Purgatory, so I read, I went back to... Um, Canto Snide, kind of rather than just jumping all in. And as I was reading Canto 11, it kind of changed my focus and my center because as I'm reading it, I kept going back like saying, wait, this sounds so much like the Lord's Prayer. You know, maybe a more, uh, we have maybe a more modern reading of it. Um, but as I was reading, uh, continuing on, like things uh, came to mind. I'll call them uh, apologies for those, for this term, the best thing I could think of is Catholic brain fart. You know, like and other things they were talking about, you know, this uh, is there any meaning to the numbers and the direction? And uh, the, the, I think this may be in Cantos 12 when uh, before he entered, you know, when the, the, he, he put the marks on his forehead and the show the divinity and just his uh, humility, like he bowed down. He said he pounded on his chest three times. That made me think when you're making the sign of the cross, you go father on the forehead, son around the belly button, then Holy Spirit, it's three taps on the chest. Whether that's just, you know, okay, it's just a fluke or that actually is significant. Um, and also about the thing with the direction of the right. I just think, um, I think of the Nakeem Creed and um, uh, Lord Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. So it's like, okay, you know, the ultimate is to, you know, the highest is to the left. And even as he's circling around um, the direction, he's, like Joe mentioned, he's heading up the mountain in purgatory. Um, and I noticed like midway through in the contest we're reading where the, sh I think they call them the shades were um, referring to um, Dante. At one time, I think they actually used the phrase the Holy Spirit with a capital S now. And is it kind of implying, well, you know, is for someone reading this, is Dante in fact the Holy Spirit leading you to um, ultimate salvation? And, there, and he was even shocked at how um, gracious they were. It's almost like he wanted to help them out. And even saying, you know, this is, if you do this, this is what, you know, less you need, baby, to at least, you know, absolve you of your, to pay off your debt. Like I said, purgatory, you still have a chance. This is a, maybe the redemption versus the salvation that's ultimate when you're up at the top. And like an emphasis on seven, like the seven sacraments, the seven deadly sins. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, I think the last time I said, as Virgil, he repeatedly emphasizes how Dante is like, still, you're stuck on, um, earthly thoughts, you know, you're thinking in terms of um, earth reality versus in heaven, you know, you've got the light and the light won't blind you. And all this other things and the joy, how, you know, it's, it's almost like the joy is exponential growth. You know, you have it, you give it versus it's like, okay, you, if you give something away, that is gone versus, well, it's like creates more. And like, if you've had that, you know, where you're generous of spirit and whatever, you you could care less and then like uh, let's talk about the lights bouncing around so even physics is thrown in here for those that maybe don't appreciate the religion when it's talking about the beams of light and how they reflect it the same way they come in then it briefly brings in um ethics so like i said there's all different ways to read this and unfortunately i want to reread and go back and uh um the like when, the, when they're chanting in the i don't know if it's italian or latin it's like well okay if i go and look that up i'm gonna lose the flow because you know, like you said google it's Google's it will be around for a while. And it's not like, okay, I, uh, I won't be able to look up those terms. So even those that may be a lay person, like I said, you can get a lot out of just the, the um, and like the, uh, when it describes atmospheres, like at one point, you know, the 
the fog's so dense. If anyone's ever been outside on a very humid day or the fog you can't see in front of your face and how it's slow, it, it usually is a rhythmic uh, either dissipation. So like I said, there's a lot of emphasis. And the last, uh, sorry, I just say one last thing. I found it weird. I can't remember which it had to do with but how it said almost the punishment um, to get to pay the debt, how they had their eyes uh, covered with iron, so they couldn't see, and you know the walling and the grief, but still they were, I guess, happy that they were still in purgatory and had a chance of getting, um, reaching salvation. But that's like almost to the point: is it better off in purgatory versus knowing you still had that chance to be there, and some had been there for you know maybe centuries. So it's kind of even in purgatory, it doesn't. It's maybe coming up dandelions. We're not quite to daffodils and roses or not um, irises. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. You managed to hit a lot of points fairly, fairly compactly. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Elena, Allison, and Madeline. Elena. Yes, I'm here. And uh, yeah. let me let me just give what I have a question. You have some sound sounds uh elena you're going in oh, and can out. can you hear me can you hear me now yes okay great uh, so what i what appears to me is that uh, there is one of the concepts that the freedom to do exactly as one pleases a traveler arrives to that freedom because of traveler's will can, can no longer err meaning you are at the point going through the purgatory you are at the point so whatever whatever you conceive whatever you you intend to do becomes beautiful and possible and will and realizes in the material world or whatever whatever else you call it and that happens through the process of cleaning up going through the steps and traveling the road and ascending to, to the point where it becomes possible. Um, therefore, for instance, when we say Marilyn Monroe was, uh, um, Doug was saying like she was so dumb and you know very much uh, in a state of uh, deep depression, regardless whenever she was uh, acting being you know being on a set suddenly she becomes alive and incredible the only one in the world there is no one who would match her as much um to this point so that that's very interesting when someone goes and goes to the point of ascending and getting to the point of where um whatever you wish becomes possible Whatever, whatever you intend to do becomes possible. That's to me is uh, the process of traveling through this particular stage of uh, existence. And uh, yes, my question is uh, if anyone has to say something to the add to that because of you know it's it's interesting to hear the Hollywood perspective. Acting is we we are actors in life. So. Thank uh, you so thank much. You. Thank you. If we have time, I'm going to ask Doug the question about art. Uh, you know, artist, um, you know, in terms of kind of sometimes, you know, the artists are very tortured, but they were, they produce is magnificent. So what is the, what is the nature of that? We'll at some point, you know, a little bit later on, I want to ask uh, Doug that question. Um, it's a really fascinating topic. Uh, next up is Alison followed by Madeline. Alison. Um, so as I was reading this, I kept thinking, why does he have this whole section on love in the middle of talking about purgatory. And I kept going back and forth until I finally, I think I figured it out. And um, so in Canto 13, he says, um, I did not seek my peace with God, not till my final hour came. And even then penance would not have reduced my debt. Um, so he's, you know, he's talking about these people who, who suddenly, you know, find God just before they're gonna die. And, and like, it's like, oh, I believe in you now, please let me go to heaven, okay? But then in, in the whole section on love, he's talking about like different kinds of love. And he's talking at first about love that's really not, not a good kind of love at all. And he talks about um, people when they're, they're trying to compete with their neighbors, they're trying to one up people, they're angry. 
Um, and then he goes on and then he talks about a pure love. And so the way that I took that is that some love is really about trying to get something for yourself. And that's not really a pure love. That's like the person who is saying, oh, I, I believe in God. I love God so I can get to heaven. Because really what you want is something for yourself. It's not about a real true love for God. And the same thing with love, like a gold digger, okay? A gold digger is not about loving something. A gold digger is about trying to get something for themselves. Um, but when he goes on to the other one, where he says, all of you vaguely apprehend and crave a good which, um, with which your heart may be at rest, and even so strives to reach that goal. Um, but then, oh wait, uh, where did we go? But just the whole thing, oh, another good, um, if you aspire to it or grasp at it with only lukewarm love, then on this ledge you will be punished once you have confessed. And that to me ties right back to the other thing. Um, so I think what he's saying is that um, the love for God has to be like the love for a person. It's not about what are you getting from this? It's about what are you giving? And it's, it's, it's very selfless. Um, and then once I made that connection, then it, it made sense with why this whole section is in here. Um, ho hopefully we'll get to talk about, uh, you know, love in Dante uh, throughout, uh, because yeah. that was the point that uh, Doug was also making that that is there, that's the theme that is there throughout. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline, David, and Peter. Madeline. Well, um, it seems that Dante was very, very into how things were arranged in space and time. And the Purgatorio is the central book of the three. And this is the central section of the Purgatorio. And so I'm wondering if uh, we're going to see later on through the rest of this book and then in the next one, if it's going to unfold symmetrically, like in a mirror kind of chiastic structure, uh, outward from the center, uh, if anyone has read um, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, that's an example where it's made very overt. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's going to do that. And uh, I also liked uh, the points that people made, what Doug said about fear and love and the spur and the rain, uh, there, were, there were a lot of hawk and horse training imagery in here. Um, and also he, in this central section, he consistently emphasizes that there's a middle ground, that uh, prodigality is just as much of a uh, bad thing, I forget if it's a vice or a sin, but anyway, as uh, avarice, and the middle ground is what he calls generosity. Uh, I also wonder what it would have been like to have been writing this. Like what his, and what made me think that was um, the part about, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, Statius, Statius. Um, at any rate, Virgil's uh, replacement who is being eased into things. And the translation that I have, the, the glosses in the back talked about well, everyone's looked into it, and is there a, um, you know, what could he really have been a Christian, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, it really doesn't matter. Dante, as a writer, needed someone to take over from Virgil uh, because Virgil wasn't a Christian. So this character came to him and said, okay, how about me? I lived in the right era. I could have been a Christian, and maybe I was just hiding it. So there are some things that are like that, that seemed like they must have just come to him. But how he could have seen the whole thing unfolding as a pattern, like did he, he must have sketched, sketched the whole thing out in advance. Um, but how he could have seen the whole pattern and gone weaving and stitching back and forth from beginning to end in the three books and looking at how they balanced out. It's just, it's fascinating to think of what it must have been like for him to be doing this. Uh, thank you, Madeline. I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, if you look at kind of the structures of various works of art, they differ quite a bit. Uh, it's not a universal, it, there's a whole bunch of ways in which people can structure things like Beethoven's structure is different than Mozart's structure, for example. 
um, and Vivaldi structure is something else. Uh, so I, I, I personally don't know enough about this. So, but, uh, you know, anytime, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to have everybody commenting first, then we are going to go into breakout rooms to discuss it in small groups. And then we're going to come back with the best questions that we have on this. And then we're going to try to answer all the questions together. Okay, so that's the format. Next up is going to be David, followed by Peter. David. Hi, yeah, I'm glad to join you. I'm sorry I had missed the very beginning. And your question seems like at the moment it's fairly comprehensive on the whole section we read maybe, right? Yes. Okay, so I want to stray off the- You're also, uh, David, you're also welcome to, we're kind of in the middle of the book. You're welcome to talk about Dante in general or your experience of reading Divine Comedy in, in particular. So floor is it's, yours. It's interesting, as Madeline said, we're sort of on the bridge in the middle of the middle. So it's a fascinating point to look at the whole structure as far as we've gotten, imagine where it's going and what he's foreshadowed. Um, and he seems to be unraveling all kinds of problems and issues that you know would seem impossible to put together into one quilt. But then again, this kind of writing, sewing everything together, I guess that's like, Boccaccio and Cervantes, I, you know, it's a little later, but uh, so it's interesting. He's if he's going to pack everything into the encyclopedia. So we've gone through the worst of the worst. And then even the people who struggled, you know, with things and, and just overstep bounds to a degree, uh, you know, looking at material wealth going too far and and whereas comparing that to spiritual wealth. So we're beginning to make these really fine distinctions about how could you cross that line where well, you wanted too much power? Power is a good thing. So we're now looking at balances that are a lot more subtle. And you can open these questions. And he's, he's having Virgil uh, as maybe his internal reason or as the voice of universal reason for us all. It doesn't really make a difference. The story's unfolding with Virgil helping us understand. Um, but he says such interesting things here. He's talking about uh, specifically mankind seeing the source of everything, good and evil, as all coming from heaven. Oh, good and evil coming, and, and that everything we do is like, it's all heaven's fault. Well, that, you know, and if we're all, if it's all determined and charged, then there's no point to morality. There's not, you can't make sense of a morality like that. And he says, I'm going to explain that. How's he going to explain that? This is like the fundamental conundrum. Uh, and we still talk about this and he's talking about it then. So somehow he wants to reveal how love can be in charge of everything. And yet we can be doing such a bad job at points with all that love. He says the light of reason still tells right from wrong. Okay, but all love is, the fault is going to be in ourselves, he says. It's always going to be fault in ourselves. We need restraint by law. Okay, so reason's going to reel us in by law, but all the actions we take are going to be directed by love. So even the avarice, I mean, we're still acting on love. And everything we feel love for, we're supposed to have some love. You know, so we're supposed to love the material world as a gift and beneficence and appreciate. So that wasn't wrong. So how do we get the reason and jumbled and confused that that love turns to something perverse? because we have love for all the things that can be wrong to be loving if it goes too far. So, <laughs> you know, how do we not fall to error and let these same, these blessing of love turn into a sinful, uh, a rise for a sinful pleasure. It's sort of uh, for him to deal with that and then to bring it. So by the time we're in Canto 18, I think that's the critical one for me in his, putting into a, a logical form, an explanation of how free will is there for us to balance. And the answer lies, he says, in face mysteries, but he's not giving up. You know, he still works out that technically we're, we're, we have freedom. And how does that perception work? It begins with senses. And he does this analysis from senses to perception to understanding, building levels of what it is we experience in our consciousness. We get more subtle. And, and that somehow love will be the spiritual motion of it all. And reason is what's going to break 
the power of love when it has to, because reason we always have to exercise with all those desires. It's desires and reason. It's that balance. So um, uh, I just have never seen it so beautifully laid out. I mean, I'd like to point to sections of it, but uh, he says by the, the point he's tying it up that these noble powers Beatrice will comprehend as the free will. So remember that when you go up there, she's going to tell you how it all works out, that you have free will to balance reason against all the passions, which you're supposed to have anyway. So uh, I'm looking forward to the answers. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you. And what, what we'll do is I will raise this question because these are, you know, the, the, especially the question about love and when it becomes uh, kind of perverse and when it kind of con when they conflict with each other uh, or all, all of that, I think I'm looking forward to discussing that in the lightning round. Uh, wonderful. Uh, next up is Peter. I personally think that one of the greatest difficulties as English speakers in reflections on Dante's work is that how we use the English word love. And to me, a lot of what it kind of evokes, uh, despite you know all the different contexts in which you use it, is in my mind far more simplistic than where Dante is coming from. You know, from where the ancient Greeks of the range from agape to philia to of uh, the erotic. And to me, in so many ways, as he points out over and over and over again, in my opinion, one of the most fruitful and most difficult, I would say, reflections on his work is seeing all of these levels of dimensions of the expression of love. From, you know, what, whether it be for more harmonious or more perverted, but really looking at it viscerally within our own very soul, as he looked within his, his interpretation or inspiration to reflect on all the different ways the natural fundamental motivation for connection how, the different ways it can come out and what leads to more um, the path toward, let's say, of a satisfaction or harmony or rest or of a beauty or truth. And the ways in which he, in the middle of his life, at least within this fictionalized version of himself, went about exploring about it. I mean, for first was, well, to really realize, of, um, you know, as Virgil said, that the way up was down. Every time he tried to purify his spirit to take that fundamental libido and to direct it more towards nobler things, the gravitational pull just kept skewing it all to all these basic base levels that we all face with. And so when it came down to that shedding light and gaining that self-knowledge in relationship to all of these, not just an intellectual understanding, but a willingness to face the harsher realities before we can through our own type of internal purgatory, if we take that metaphor in regards to, you know, within life, how we have the, uh, the, the tools to self-correct. So it's not just a matter of um, the strength of will to maintain a domination of the fundamental passions, but no, but how do we increase the quality of them? How do we take the, uh, the, the baser instincts and passions so that they work more towards the beauty and nobler aims of which we aspire? How can we get more in communion with the different sides to ourselves so that they work with each other rather than against? And to me, I, I find that all of these many different ideas about oh, what is love, you know, what is it, does it mean in regards to of um, how we relate our own personal experiences of what love is and what Dante is talking about in each of these realms that he visits, both of what he sees of other people and what he personally experiences within it. How can we empathize with all the characters involved of their manifesting what they are because of some aspect of love based on how, however twisted it is, it's still fundamental in regards to what is the ultimate of God's creation at least, you know, within his perspective. So how seeing it in that sort of um, divine uh, uh, conduit of what is manifestation, what is of uh, creation, and how through his purification and purgatory to figure out what does it mean to humanize the parts of himself that he rejected so that they become more, the vices turn themselves into virtues that we all, you know, want love and connection. We all want to connect with ourselves. I mean, 
I'm sorry, I'm a bit rambling here at this point. Um, I, to get back to my point, I, I do definitely think that just, I don't mean to oversimplify to Freud's libido, but with his model, um, we're going basic to the, the erotic. How do we take fundamental lust, that mag, anim, animal magnetism to connect? And so that can we take those fundamental passions and through wisdom, figure out how to mature them as we ascend up towards of uh, tempering them into the higher forms of mm, more, more, I guess, of uh, harmonious and whole manifestations. I feel that so much of what, he, after he was able to face, in my opinion, uh, through Inferno, uh, being able to face the fundamental beast of the essence of his soul or humanity, as we all have, the ability to have, um, work with these energies so that his mind was not disassociated from them. So there then could be a tempering work with them towards not just uh, to, of, um, to figure out just like of um, smelting iron of how to work with them so that they're able to build on top of each other for that type of um, mm, well, synergistic kind of uh, um, well, elevation of, of being able to be in these subtle areas of mind and spirit in a stable way because the, the, the pyramid had thus far been built. I guess I'll stop there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That, that, was, that was excellent. Um, so folks, what we're going to do now is we're going to now divide into three small groups so we can discuss it. Each of it's going to be facilitated one by Doug, one by Joe, and one by me. Um, and we will discuss, uh, you know, in a much more free, free flowing way for 20 minutes. And then when we come back, we ask the biggest question that we have. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. Uh, we're going to get started. Give me just a second here. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. So it's time for the lightning round. So this is the time when you bring up the best questions that you have. And we will collect, I'm going to collect all the questions, organize them, and then we are going to pose them one by one and everybody gets to answer them. Okay, so that's called the lightning round. But before we go into it, I want to tell you that um, I'm doing another meetup at 7.30 today on my favorite video of all times. Uh, and that is a video by Jacob Bronowski. And that is the final episode of his series, Ascent of Man, called The Long Childhood. Now, even if you have not heard the, uh, seen the video, that's fine. I'll, I'll be talking about all the main themes in it. I'll be uh, kind of, you know, talk, raising all of it. And it's going to be interactive way of looking at this large theme of neotony, of how we are, you know, long Long childhood is something that really characterizes us as human beings. So that's at 7.30. Hope you can make it. All right, folks. So it's time for questions. Go ahead and type exclamation mark. If you'd like to put a question on the table, there are a couple of things that we've uh, come up with, uh, you know, that Maxine raised um, that I want to talk about. So that, that one question would be, what is the relationship between the the troubledness of an artist and the magnificence of his work. How, how does that actually integrate? Uh, but go ahead and put, uh, and then of course, I would like to bring up questions about love, um, which is a critical topic that came up multiple times. Um, but go ahead and type exclamation mark if you have, if you'd like to put your own questions on the table so we can uh, hear everybody's answers to it. Elena, what's your question? Okay, I unmuted myself and let me bring my cell phone away so it I would sound clear. Okay, uh, Joe, go ahead. Here uh, I am. Okay. Uh, here I am. I'm, I'm asking a question, um, and just so for what. Uh, Obviously, if you're going through the steps and the levels of purgatory, um, how to, so you're supposed to, you know, this, this, this uh, quote unquote scenes, you feel it and you experience it. 
And then um, I, from what I've seen here, you have to experience the and learn how to experience the opposite. So say you have you have a last to to have something in your life, such as you want to let's see whatever Tesla, um, and then the opposite of it. Oh, I'm happy with uh, whatever Lexus 1998. Uh, just, just physical example, right? And the same thing with other feelings and attachments and, and such. So whoever has, you know, just give me a reflection of what they think about experiencing the opposite. Thank you. Okay, experiencing the opposite, okay. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, Vanessa, Maxine, and Madeline. Joe, what's your question? Um, I would like to know what people's thoughts are in the relationship between pride, envy, and wrath specifically. Uh, pride and wrath? Pride, envy, and, and wrath. Envy and wrath. Okay, very yeah, good. Yeah, specifically. I Excellent. know that they're all interrelated, but those three in particular seem to really build on one another. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Vanessa. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, this may sound like an odd question, but it's been the one thing was talking about how it's impossible for, for man for self-hatred. Now, how does he allow for like mental illnesses? Because there are some mental illnesses out there or just whatever you want to say where one maybe is incapable, Got it. Or, you know, truly does want to harm themselves. If, if not in this work, does he deal with it in other works or address it? Okay, thank you. Uh, how does Dante allow for mental illnesses? Uh, next up is going to be Maxine followed by Madeline. Maxine, what's your question? I I don't really have a question except that all uh, the artists, if you have. No, 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 we'll do questions. We're just doing questions now. We'll get to talk about artists soon when we raise the question. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. thanks. Well, then uh, next, next up is Madeline. Yes, uh, my question is for Doug. Uh, if he could, or anyone really, um, I would just like to hear more about specific instances of motion uh in this central section of cantos wonderful emotions in um yeah specific you know where where things really stand out got it okay all right anybody else wants to put, put any question on the table C could you tie it to the church uh the the motion to church no tie purgatory purgatory to church okay very good uh okay purgatory and church okay all right um let's see doug has a question doug go ahead uh you're on mute a couple of questions came up in our group one is what is really the process of repentance how does that work in the divine comedy mm -hmm. and the issues of time travel how does dante work with that learn about that explore that um and uh there was a question from b they uh, love and envy the coupling of love and envy i mean she was fascinated by that which we didn't really explore too much but that's an and she may want to clarify the question uh and then there were but that coupling of love and envy was interesting um uh, and the the issues of expiation of sin versus how the progress is made which kind of relates to the uh, repentance or the process uh seemed unclear to a couple of people Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, let's let's start with um, love because Doug, you had made a comment that love is a theme that runs through, um, and there are people asking when is it? Uh, last time uh, in the main session, people asking when is it that it becomes bad? If this is the the prime mover, when is it that it becomes perverted? So just question about love um, and how, what role it plays in Divine Comedy of Dante. If you would like to answer, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark. Uh, Doug, you want to start? Yeah, I think uh, uh, what Peter said is that there are many different forms of love and there are, uh, but I want to say one thing, which I said a few months ago, maybe, uh, 
the Roman treatise, scientific treatise on the nature of things by Lucretius begins with a deep bow to the power of Venus as the force behind everything. And I think that is sort of the subtext of a lot of this work that's based on the classical tradition like Dante and the troubadours, that yes, it gets rarefied, it gets sublimated, it goes into new directions, maybe it's misused and it's repented of, but Venus is the power, you know, at the, at the source of the universe. And that's, that's in the scientific treatise where Lucretius actually defines what an atom is. But the love thing, the other thing I wanted to talk about is about 40 years ago, I directed Shakespeare's most violent play, Titus Andronicus. And I did it because I'd been watching the Godfather movies and I'd been watching, reading the play and I realized all these families do the most horrific things, usually motivated by love of their family. You know, love actually motivates them to do the worst violence to other people. And that fascinated me, both in the Godfather films and in Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus. And so that that love is a double-edged sword, that there can be too little love, and that's a sin. There can be too much love. I mean, love that's not really expressed or love that's overexpressed. So that the love is, and I, I guess Freud said the two main tasks of life are love and work. How do you balance those things? And um, and I think it comes up in all the uh, the great poets, uh, whether they're Sufi or Indian or uh, Taoist or, you know, how do you balance these definitions and words? Uh, Wonderful. So I'll leave it at that for now. But uh, Wonderful. Th thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next up is going to be David followed by Joe. David, what do you think? There. Uh, yeah, the the question of love from in, in Dante, where he plants at least part of an answer, um, he is, I think, in Canto 17, uh, around line 90, uh, neither creature, neither creator nor creatures move, but through love. Um, I'm shortening it. Natural love may never fall into error. Uh, but you can strive to bad ends, and you know, too little or too much. We know that's the problem. So while desiring the eternal good, you know you're okay, but you have to measure. So there's something where you're going to have love. This is pure and overwhelming, maybe, but you also have an ability to measure and gauge. So I guess that's reason, because that's where he's giving us the uh, a control lever you know that we can't not have love for everything even the things we shouldn't and you know maybe we're not giving enough love to something but something in us lets us do the gauging that, that so I, if you go on reading then we'll go into joe's question which we'll do next uh joe what do you think about this question of love in dante david just took, literally just took my answer it's re it, the interesting thing about this is that it caught and doug you know you kind of reminded me of this is this idea of how love is motivated for family but it often can act as it can compromise our re ability to reason and so that it's a perversion of it our 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 free will because we can make if we have our free will that's this is dante's whole argument that you know we're we're making decisions within our uh, within our own uh, faculties that are based on ethics. But then love comes in, whether it be a love, and it could be love for anything at this point, and it's perverted and it causes us our rational faculty. And then all of a sudden now we're, we're, we're out of balance and we can end up in purgatory and for the, for the, if we're lucky. Um, but in this particular instance, but it, it's, it's the inability, it's this, uh, um, and I guess that's like where you can start to think of love and nature being very important, the link between love and nature to be very important because if you love according to nature, that is what God's giving you, then if, and if you have a belief in this higher power, well then 
you can uh, then you're loving in accordance to a balance, a certain balance mm -hmm. that is actually that we're again we arrive to through reason. But anyway, that was kind of a long way of saying that it can pervert our reason Wonderful. And, our, and our free will, which is really important. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is uh, Allison. Allison. Um, yeah, and that really relates to what we were talking about in our breakout room, because we were saying, you know, like on one hand, Dante's saying, you know, the primal will is neither laudable nor blamable. I mean, he's saying like, um, we don't have any control of it. I mean, nobody chooses love, it just chooses you. But at the same time, we do have free will. And so it's this dilemma of, you know, the passions taking over, but you have free will and this constant battle between the two is really like at the heart of everything in literature, everything in life, the whole history of the world is sometimes comes right down to that battle. Um, and, you know, we were saying like there, divorce lawyers wouldn't be rich if it wasn't for that battle, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's- Thank it's, you. It's, Thank you. Yeah. No, that, that's very interesting because in, in some ways it is a reaction, right? It is a reaction to something out there. Uh, in some way, it is a proactive action. And so there is like combination of both those things uh, going on. And then you have the ability to reason about it and to look for balance, whether it is right, whether it is wrong, whether it is too much, too little, whether something is missing, all of that. So wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is Peter. I just want to go off what Joe was talking about. Uh, I definitely, in regards to treating love as a passion that warps our ability to reason, I feel that Dante's message, in my opinion, is clear in relationship to his experience with Limbo and Virgil, of, the, uh, of them being the virtuous pagans, that they live in peace, but they are absent in love. And Virgil, in describing of Limbo uh, in uh, Purgatory, was that it is not filled with the groans and moans of the suffering, but the sighs of the discontent. That they're, they are, are so elevated and so detached from any sense of a soul. And that is why Virgil's so much just a disembodied intellect, a ghost, uh, someone who of, uh, envies, uh, and well, um, envy might not be the right word, but uh, perhaps lament that it, the doors of heaven is, are closed before as being a shadow, as being in the sort of eternal space without change or growth, that these souls, you know, however brilliant, are trapped in an unfeeling space from the essence of, you know, to, the, to those below them that would be tortured by their own character where these uh, are not, are numb. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right. Uh, let's go to now Joe's question, uh, which is um, how, you know, what is the nature of pride, envy, and wrath? And how, how do you distinguish uh, between them? And then perhaps how do you connect it to love uh, and its perversions that we're talking about? David followed by Peter. Right, this is what I was saying that, that I think this follows right after the section I was reading about how you balance. Then he says, but it can fall out of balance. And he says there are three ways the mortal clay can fall out of balance. Um, <clears throat> one is about hoping to advance, the other is about another's rise, and the third is about vengeance. So these three things, and he's gonna discuss them each separately, so let's break them apart. Pride is, they're all based on too much love of approval, too much of love of worldliness and needing the world to affirm you. And seeing that as what affirmation as opposed to the connection that's the pure love connection. So when it's connected to things like that, it becomes one's own grasping. And that is the first mistake. If you're a grasping, overly grasping, then your material world success is pride because it's a confusion of what you're doing with greatness. And, you know, as though that's the love you need is the world, you know, to shower you with things. The second thing is 
when someone else has worldly success and you look at their gaining things and you mix that your love is about the things and they're getting the things then you're the other's gain is something that you are unhappy with this is your envy this is the envy is a misdirected love towards things because other people get things because they do it what they love the third is seeing it all incorrectly as a zero-sum balance that what i don't get because somebody else gets what they get is you know that their gain is my loss then you have anger at the other person is revenge so all these are about having put the love and too much love on the worldly and the the love of approval of others and things like that that aren't at all what i mean i guess some of that has to be good because the soul is given that kind of love but when it's too much it's oppressive and i just want to say that i know i've already gone along we're talking about high powers higher powers this is a fascinating discussion. You really can't do that in many meetups. So this is fantastic, Sri Khan. And I think this also, this book this is a Mozartian structure of art because <clears throat> if he wants to talk about something, he pre-shadows it and then he summarizes it as a structure and then he plays out the structure. And, you know, here come the three pride, envy, and, you know, it's going to all play out. So, you know, the form as you're experiencing the form is very premeditated and he has to explain everything. So it's all broken down. You have a total balance. Very Mozartian. Wonderful. David, that was that was excellent. The, the description of uh, pride, envy and uh, thank you. Next up is Peter, Joe and Mike. Peter. To me, I feel like this idea of all those who are in the inferno are so stuck in regards to their idea of self and so divorced from their own souls, where to me, the, the beginning of purgatory is that idea of self that ossified or crystallized shining power that is pride, that is in many ways a reactionary uh process of maintaining identity away from all of the, the pushes and pulls of the passions and so that that uh, that strength of individualization that of, uh, can keep us well that keeps us numb because it allows us to have a a sort of um a stability that 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 is already in a state of necrosis because it's not filled with live passion and feeling and so it is only through that that we then by challenging i believe our own pride we then get to well face the things that we don't want to experience which the fact is we're deeply insecure you know despite all the ways that we try to feel good about ourselves about our virtues or pretend we do not have particular vices or whatever there is that deep that deep envy of all the things that we do not yet have and the torture of what it means to to experience that and this then that raw that true flame of that reactionary necrosis of that wrath and it is only after that we face and experience all that of um that of uh, that already pent up um resistance to that which we reject as being some uh, as part of our in, the incompleteness or view of incompleteness then you know the idea of sloth that all the, that all the passion is gone because so much was so what has moved us has been from defensiveness this idea of fighting to maintain our sense of self which as an aim is not an issue but how it comes out as this uh this pride that keeps us separated from the essence of who we are let alone of god and so it is only after sloth that we then get more in touch with what is that deeper fire that deeper fire connected towards going after what we want and what we think and feel is good on a, on a more intuitive level than something that is more of a born based and conditioned from the, you know, the social dynamics, as David was saying, of vanity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I was watching the video of Jordan Peterson in the Bible series on the resurrection of Jesus. And the point that Jordan Peterson was making there is that in order to be healthy, you have to be willing to let pieces of you die and be reborn. I think 
pride, envy, and wrath are when you refuse to accept your limitations, your, you know, the nature of nature of the world and your own limitations. And it's like, it's so it's there are kind of different ways of rebelling against, against those things. And I think the solution is, is the acceptance and, you know, willingness to go through this kind of accept the suffering that comes from your limitations um, with serenity in, in some way, which is, which is very hard. Um, so I, I was wanted to connect uh, those two things up. Next up is Joe, Mike, and Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of build on that, and, and I and something that Peter alluded to actually in the beginning, uh, I just want to call out attention to is that um, I almost look at this entire thing differently based on what he was saying is that uh, I always I look at purgatory as a whole. Um, almost like Plato's symposium now, where they go through each area, what is love? And they everybody gives a speech as to what it is. And this is actually what the absence is of love or the perversion of love and an explanation of what it looks like and in, in a story format. And it's a really interesting way of kind of writing this. It's I, I really thought that, that but the, it was a couple of comments that he had made but something that coming back to just to build on what you just said, uh, you know, in, I look at it as in a term, stoic terms, where if there's acceptance, you know, there's, and if you don't accept where you are, you're not going to be content. So that can, that discontentment has a way of manifesting itself and in other ways. So I'm not, I'm not accepting where I am in life, um, I am, I, and and the discipline of uh, uh, the discipline of desire really is called the discipline of acceptance. You know, is really like the discipline of acceptance because you're kind of looking at things or what are in your control and what are outside of your control, and you're accepting things for what they are. You're accepting the limitations as you just spoke about, but when you don't accept those things, it leads to a certain amount of contempt. And that contempt can build in, in a number of ways. And so then that contempt uh, can reach out to, can start to uh, manifest itself where you're, you have contempt not only for yourself, but for other people. And that's where it starts to turn into envy. And then that envy really quickly turns into anger. And so that's where these three, I, I really saw that linked very closely uh, in the dialogue when the inability of um, uh, whatever, I forget her name, Sophia, not, not Sophia, uh, whatever. Yep. I, I said it earlier, Yes. but um, she was in, she is incapable of being satisfied with her own, with her own personal success and versus she was taking more pleasure and the people actually hurt that the, the people that she was uh, uh, hurting and doing better than. And there is a saying that immediately came to mind when I was reading that it was, it's not enough that I succeed, it's that all around me must fail. And so this idea is just where I'm thinking is that it's not only you have enough, but it's this just this, this perversion of accepting whatever is, and it may not even necessarily be, you can have the most and still not accept it. So it's, it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, that's the, the link between these three I saw was, you know, very, very strong. And I, and I saw it in, and if this is all about ethics, this is how the three are interrelated. Oh, wonderful. I mean, I, yeah. And I think that acceptance is the key thing because what happens is that like, it's, it's kind of acceptance of your limitations and acceptance of suffering, which is there. And if you, re, if you refuse to accept, then you are basically angry at the world itself. And then one aspect of that is envy, which is directed to other people. One aspect of that is pride, which is directed, it's just you're trying to artificially claim something for yourself, which is not there. And then you, you know, kind of, so, so I think the 
the acceptance is is a crucial thing and it's not i mean the kind of acceptance that jordan peterson talks about no. it's not it's not a passive acceptance okay it is not one that leads to sloth or you know kind of inaction it is actually kind of letting piece of you die and so it is it is quite hard <laughs> it is literally saying that okay i'm prepared to let go of things that i once valued because i don't see them as being part of nature go ahead joe can i just make a very quick comment because there, there's a really important distinction between what even you know what modern philosophers or, or jordan peterson and has you know has said in the past specific to this uh area is that um we and this he looks at at, at suffering as random right this is suffering of god's will right you're not accepting god's will mm -hmm. and there's a that's a really big distinction between these modern philosophers and this idea of whatever suffering is can turn into resentment very quickly and turns into anger and it's discontentment mm -hmm. so um but this is also an affront to god in this particular instance, whereas, you know, modern psychologists will often look at it as like, okay, the universe is not working against you. Random things, bad things happen to people. It happened to you. Once you take the step outside of that and accept that, then you can start to take your suffering and turn it into actually acceptance and, and, and move forward. But in this particular case, they're saying God gave you this cross if you don't accept it, then you're re rebelling against it. Mm -hmm. And that, but it's both arriving at the same place. Yes. You're arriving at anger. Yes. That's yes. so the, the, that's the really important part out of this is that one is saying scientifically, Hey, the universe is not working against you, but the other one is saying, Hey, you're rejecting God's will. Yes. So that's a really important point. And I strongly recommend that last lecture of uh, Jordan Peterson in the Bible series on the resurrection, because it, he makes this point that, you know, he makes it on one hand on the kind of scientific and secular basis of kind of our limitations, and then on the religious basis and says that basically it's the same thing, looked at it from kind of different perspectives. Um, all right, next up is going to be, uh, uh, Joe, great, great points. Uh, next up is Mike, Vanessa, Madeline, and Peter. Mike. Well, love is uh, kind of the theme of uh, all of Dante's work. Uh, the inscription above the gates of hell in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the first one we read uh, said, I, I, he, he built this because we, he loves you. He loves you, not because he's punishing you. Um, and, and love is the source of all of hell. Uh, uh, and uh, hell was created uh, for because of the love of God uh, to show the uh, world the uh, and to show them the uh, goodness uh, of uh, uh, the goodness of love and uh, what it means uh, when God so loved the world that He uh, staged the crucifixion of His only Son. Uh, a loving parent angrily disciplines his child, uh, his child, while uh, a, a kidnap, a perverted kidnapper con conjoles him and gives him candy and talks nice. Um, the um, uh, there's a couple different kinds of love that I talked about here. Uh, one of them is desire and lust and uh, gluttony and greed. Uh, the mid stage is uh, deficient love, which is uh, uh, which is kind of just an indifference and sloth, and the worst kind is malicious love with wrath, envy, and pride. Now I, I think um, uh, Dante got all this from Augustine's City of God, which he repackaged to make it popular literature, uh, as uh, was mentioned. Uh, um, and Plato and others talked about what love meant in very similar terms. 
uh, but uh, Dante presented it in a more colorful term. One thing that I got out of City of God, and Augustine uh, had some doubts as to a lot of stuff, including doubting the Trinity and doubting a number of things. But uh, his concept of purgatory was God don't make junk. And uh, the uh, purpose of all these devices was to purify the souls and salvage the souls of the fallen. So uh, even Stalin or Hitler uh, could be cleaned up and made, and made presentable. So Thank I'll you. yield the balance of my time. Graciously accepted. Uh, thank you, Mike. Next up is Vanessa, Madeline, and Peter. Vanessa. Okay, well, I think when you deal with a pride and envy, you, um, at their extreme, the individual might either have a low self-worth or, um, self or a poor self-esteem or low, well, the self-esteem self-worth is at a lower level, whether they're trying to, you know, put up a false front and I mean, I could think of the like, compensating for this, like, especially with the pride, you think, can you imagine someone says, well, my dog sleeps on 700 pound Egyptian cotton sheets. Okay, I mean, how many people sleep on that to begin with? And you're bragging that your dog is sleeping on that. Um, and I think I would put rats as maybe on this mutation uh, of um, love and passion. I think of a, um, that it doesn't, you know, pride and envy, it may not necessarily come from that, but I, going to use the comparison uh, to the extreme. Uh, do you cook hot dogs in a pressure cooker? Like I said, you know, you're going to have a big old mess there. It's almost like when you get it's so off balance and it's, you know, if you don't let the steam out, just like if you've ever made, you know, popcorn or you hadn't put the fork in the potato, you end up with a big old mess, you know, like so I think, you know, rats is almost its own nasty little beast there. I mean, it definitely can um, come from pride and envy, but it can be its own, uh, you know, blurb like in thank the universe. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Next up is Madeline followed by Peter. Madeline. Uh, I'd like to give two concrete examples of what Joe was talking about with envy. Um, I'm just gonna read the line. I was not wise, although Sophia was my name. And I rejoiced at others' harms much more than at my own good luck. So the two examples that came to my mind right away, uh, one was indeed the connection with wrath, um, the sense of rage and trolling that go on in social media. I was in a, in a discussion group recently online um, and the topic came up that the problem with it is that it amplifies the amount of information you get. It amplifies the comparisons between you and other people. So here are all these people, they own more than you do, they look better than you do, whatever it is that's your particular thing that really bothers you, you can find people who are superior in that way online. Um, so it amplifies the comparisons and that's why there's so much rage involved with the trolling. The second example that came to mind was an article I read recently about when people are most likely to misbehave on an airline flight, I'm saying misbehave, but you all have an idea of what I mean, you follow the news. Um, it has to do with the layout of the plane when passengers are boarding. When people in regular coach class go through first class on their way to their seats, they are much more likely to um, act up, not wear masks, harass flight attendants, whatever it is, then on planes with a different layout. Conversely, people in first class also act up when people in coach file past them during boarding, which I thought was very interesting because that means that we're also very uncomfortable with reminders that other people have much less than we do that also arouses hostility when the difference is too great. So I think Dante is talking more about possibly envy and measuring yourself against people who are roughly your peers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Next up is Peter. I think uh, to me, one point that I want to, uh, I guess, bring up is this, as we look and reflect on this idea of transcending these vices, or transforming them, 
or shifting our relationship to them. I feel that one of the uh, the easiest type of solutions is merely to repress them or suppress them so that the in the light of mind i mean i think this in my opinion this is where self-deception tends to uh come it's in its most common form is to if, if we don't see it it's not there and so if i don't shed light on it then i don't have to address it or of uh, it's then i'm able to contextualize in a way that's outside of what it actually is and to me, I find, you know, in my opinion, the real essence of his very first, uh, you know, focal point in a, in the Divine Comedy is, why can't I go up the mountain? These beasts are stopping me. Well, we all know it's like, what's stopping us from going the mountain? And, you know, Virgil, a virtuous pagan, not an angel, <laughs> comes up to him and says, the way up is down. And to me, that to me is... In my opinion, one of the most of, um, inspirational underlying aspects of, of what it means to, you know, do our own underground journey, uh, our descent into our own subconscious so that we can shed light on it instead of constantly trying through will to, to rise above it when we keep on just falling down and falling down instead of being able to have that sort of divine acceptance of that you know, so long as I reject my hatred, I'm going to secretly reject other people's hatred, you know, or openly. To me, there is that type of double standard that I feel that we always are trying to twist our way around in regards to whether it means to love ourselves and hate other people, or to love other people and hate ourselves. In my opinion, to end on that, I, I do think that the love thy neighbor as thyself is to me less a solution more just a fundamental truth that because we all in this context are sons of gods or part of humanity that how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people are so deeply intimately linked to the very core so relating how we are able to witness and relate to our own issues within is to me in my opinion uh, part of what dante's journey even before he got to purgatory Wonderful, wonderful point, uh, and that's 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 great. I mean, it's basically, it's your reaction to you and your reaction to other are actually very similar. It's not you versus others, but either you love everything and love yourself, or you are afraid of everything and you are afraid of yourself. And if you are, if you love, then you are you want to look. If you are afraid, then you want to avert. When, whenever it is there, whether it is from out, about outside or, or inside. Uh, thank you. Um, last question, which is the heart of purgatory itself. What is the nature of repentance, expiation? And um, you know, how does the church approach it if you want, but just what is the nature of repentance and expiation? So go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to answer that question. Peter. Um, this is not something I have already answered for, but there's one thing that I definitely know is not repentance, and which is, in my opinion, a very common trait. If you have a child to another child, you demand they say they're sorry. They go through this ritual of, uh, of a fake grief, because that's the expectation. So you go through this of uh, these empty motions, I mean, that are not based on feeling, or pretty much is like you instill them a feeling of shame, of self-hatred, of guilt, because, you know, it's not that they understood exactly what they did was wrong, but that the, you know, my mother or father is angry with me now. And so that's what you have issue with. Oh, I'm a bad person because I did this. And it becomes an internalized complex instead of being able to look at the logic of, oh, you know, if I want people to share toys with me, I got to be able to share, with the, share it with them. You know, I feel that the example of the plane I mean, as we all have different ideas of what's fair, you know, what is owed to us versus, you know, what is of, uh, as we try to gamble, like, okay, how, what, what, what do I deserve? What do other people deserve? If someone slaps me, you know, should I uh, say, thank you, sir, may I have another, you know, or should I slap him back, walk away, whatever. I think we all 
have different senses of what justice is outside of compassion or mercy. And so with that, to me, it's in reflection of justice within ourselves, not to necessarily find a truer form of it, but to better understand how and why we are judging that we then get to more of a sense of our own sense of, well, I did that. Oh, I guess I don't really believe what I did was right, huh? You know, on reflection, not about someone else's reflection. You know, other we all have people around our lives telling us what's right or wrong from all different angles. And like, we, you, know, you can't agree with everyone. You can't please everyone. But what does it mean within our own sense of a uh, uh, balance about, you know, how do we reflect and come to our natural conclusion at, at the very least in regards to our own intrinsic morality? It's like, oh, I don't, that, 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 that doesn't seem right. I'm not going to do that anymore. And what it means to perhaps then express like, dude, I'm, I'm sorry I did that. I didn't really, I'm not going to do that again. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that was very good. Uh, next up is Vanessa, Joe, David, and Madeline. Vanessa. Okay, for those that had questions dealing with the whole um, act of it, like in the Roman Catholic Church, um, as far as for like confession, you first go to the priest, you know, you have your list of sins. Um, the priest had a little discussion and you say, you know, you truly say, I am sorry for this. Uh, you're given like your penance, whether it's say seven Hail Marys or the Our Father, um, maybe in more modern times, you actually do, maybe you may actually apologize for the person you wronged but it's truly sincere. Unlike, you know, the kid in second grade saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I want to play my game play. Can we sit down now? Versus this, uh, someone who first became a citizen, the way they're saying the Pledge of Allegiance um, with pride, emotion, it's genuine. And then, you know, if it is a true act, you know, you say you do your penance, what the priest told you to do, then there's absolution, you know, to forgive, I absolve you of your sins. That's where some people take issue. Well, how can a, you know, someone on death row be absolved and led to heaven, you know, if, if it's a sincere act and you go through those steps, that, I mean, that's what it means in the Catholic Church, but you were truly sincere and apologizing to God and even those who wronged you, whether you do it directly or just, you know, th think, you visualize you doing that and thinking, how can I make up for my error? Like, you know, to be, be a sincere going forward. So like I said, there's a ritual and the procedure within the Catholic church, but you know, there's also what you do with your own self. You know, you don't have to be Thank you. Uh, religious to do that. Like I said, there's things you go with, you know, you, you, you write your wrongs. So there's, you know, every day, and then there's the actual nitty gritty procedures. Thank you, Vanessa. Next up. Um, so what we are going to do is that we're going to have quick answers to this. And then we're going to ask the one last question to uh, Doug about the artist, because that was really fascinating thing. I don't want to let Doug go without that. Uh, so it's going to be Joe, David, and Madeline. OK, uh, so really briefly, I mean, I think Peter kind of captured again what I was I was I'm going to try to say as well is that I, I look at this idea of um, repentance uh, and or even forgiveness is, uh, that um, the that it's a limit on our knowledge as well as a limit on our will in the sense that so that we don't know what the right thing to do in a particular situation so we end up having to repent for that and because we don't necessarily know what the and as Peter had already said, we all have this idea of what justice is, but it's not necessarily a full complete picture. So then we have this this gap we feel, and that we feel the need to, I don't know, repent, and and I think that this is where and the church will say, this is your lack of of your will to do the right thing, not the lack of your understanding. It's the lack of your will. And that's a big difference. And that's where that you're personally held now accountable for that. And that's where that idea of, in this particular instance, Catholic guilt kind of comes from is this, you know, that your, your inability to, to, um, to act properly was based on you, not necessarily your inability to reason. And I think 
you know, again, I can come and relate it back to Stoicism in a way. Stoics have this belief that nobody actually acts knowingly, uh, it, you know, uh, it, it, against what they think is right. That that there's they're they're not necessarily they're they they just lack the knowledge as to how to what they're doing is incorrect. So it's an interesting it's an interesting way of looking at repentance because you know one looks at it from a lack of knowledge and the other one looks at it from the lack of the will. Thank you. Next up is David, followed by Madeline, and then we will ask Doug the question. David. Yeah, yeah I really like what Joe was saying. Uh, the the two sides, there's emotional and there's a rational side. And dealing with the rational side, which is what's being held up here, is you know one really important thing. That's where we act with our, our gauging and making our actions. Uh, but that's in a certain way, I agree with the Stoics. I agree, with, you know, rationality sort of doesn't make mistakes. Uh, it's impossible to just solve it as a rational issue because you're always acting out of love. You're always doing something that you know on some positive motivation. So how are you messing up? Um, so it can't just be a rational solution. So there has to be an emotional angle on this. And, and that's what the, we're really being given, you know, an emotional washing in this process that's kind of has to be, has to work, but it's sort of magical. We have to see the evil in the inferno. You're steeped in it. You're stinking of it. Your eyes are covered with it. It's physical immersion and it's discomfort and fear of the stuff that's wrong is sort of refreshing honesty because it's the direct reality of the evil. And then coming through purgatory, okay, you rinse off and you're trying to be good. You have your clean garments, you've been cleansed at the bottom of the mount of purgatory and you see yourself as being marked with seven marks. And you know, you have to see yourself needing until you get it to get these things that are intrinsic in the misbehaviors and the mistakes and the mis, you know, until you you get and empathize. So going through each stage and understanding and encountering these flaws in human beings and empathizing with and hearing the flagellation of the, the angels and the songs, the wrongness of the wrongs are declared and you see the prods of what balance you to, to do the good things, to do the right. You know, living through that and having him here de depicted as singing and voices of, of angels, it has to be tactile. So there's some emotional stage that has to, there's, there's some patience. And that's why it's all this waiting. This is a long process of practicing change because what you're really trying to do is make the turning so that you're always looking in the right direction where the stars are going, right? So that ritual, the rituals are necessary, all that work, you know, somehow you have to see yourself plunged and, and physically make it a physical process emotionally. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Madeline. Yes, uh, just briefly on the etymology of repentance. Uh, the Greek word in the Bible that gets translated into our word repentance uh, is actually metanoia. Noia means perception and meta means after or with. So it's really about a change in perception. It doesn't involve an action. It doesn't involve a will. The connotation is that after you've had this change in perception, then you change your behavior. But the, the actual meaning of the word repentance as it's used in the Bible is uh, the sense of your perception of something changing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Great, great point. All right. So I've been dying to ask um, Doug this question, the question that uh, Maxine started out. I want to broaden it uh, a little bit. You, know, you see that in Marilyn Monroe. You see that in Nietzsche. You see that in Beethoven going deaf when he's composing some of his you know, great music. You see it in Dante's unrequited uh, love, and you see the great art at the same time. So what is the connection, uh, Doug? What, what do you think is the relationship between the suffering of the artist and 
the greatness of the art? Well, I, I think the question is more complicated in the United States than it is in some other countries where there's more respect for artists as successful or not. And uh, here, if you make a lot of money, then art gains a lot of respect. And if you don't, uh, it doesn't. And, and then if you make a lot of money, it gains a certain disrespect from other artists. So there's a huge ambivalence here about the arts because we're a Puritan nation. We don't really like the arts. We don't trust beauty. The thing Michael Chekhov talked about that startled me and that so few academics talk about, although some great philosophers have talked about it, is beauty. Because beauty threatens everything. It'll topple religious figures, politicians, leaders, uh, one's own sense of, you know, propriety. I mean, beauty kind of defies everything. And I think Marilyn Monroe, uh, it was Billy Wilder who actually hated working with Marilyn Monroe, but she said, he said there were two actors who really brought flesh to the screen. And one was Marilyn Monroe and one was Clara Bow who was called the It Girl in the 20s and 30s. They had this phenomenal presence on camera. I don't think um, Marilyn Monroe was a great actor in the sense of what acting was defined as in 1950, which you know was stage acting to a great degree. But in 1950, I just watched The Asphalt Jungle and it's the first time she actually plays the Marilyn Monroe character. And Louis Calhoun is just obviously blown away by the character and by Marilyn Monroe. And he and you're seeing the old actor with the new actor. And it's a it's a camera actor. It's not a stage actor. I don't know that she could have ever really acted on stage or, or brought the concentration that's needed for the role. But I know a Romanian director and he actually brainwashes actors to stop acting so they can work on film because the great stage actors out of Juilliard, they're actors and they use a big voice and, and the camera hates that. And so there are actors like Sybil Thorndike who loved Marilyn Monroe in the same movie that Laurence Olivier couldn't stand her. And she wipes Laurence Olivier off the screen. It takes an actor like Clark Gable to share the screen with Marilyn Monroe or Yves Montan to share the screen. Eli Wallach in that truck scene in The Misfits, one of her last movies, he looks totally incompetent as an actor next to her. And she's a wonderful, he's a wonderful actor. But that kind of beauty kind of destroyed her. And, uh, and, and I didn't think, I, this is something I've come to in the last 10 or 20 years as I've rewatched her film. Because when I was younger, it was like, that's Marilyn Monroe. That's not acting, that's Marilyn Monroe. But when you watch her movies now, it's phenomenal, her presence on screen, compared to any other actor she's working with. And a few people like Clark Gable, or some of the actors who own the kind of acting they do can share the screen with her. But Laurence Olivier was clearly terrified, angered, infuriated by her. And that leads to a kind of madness. And the thing about the madness I wanna talk about, Francis Yates talked about there are two kinds of melancholy. And one is creative, you're brooding on something. Like Dante says, your energy goes inward and you don't even notice the outside world. And most people assume that's madness, but it actually can be brooding on a creative idea. There are other forms of melancholy, which the Elizabethans understood these two kinds of melancholy. The other kind of melancholy will destroy you, will just take you out of this world. And I think other cultures historically have understood that better than the American culture that is terrified by melancholy, but doesn't really understand what it is and what it does. So we medicate it, you know, uh, which may be good or may not be good, depending on how it's used as part of another kind of therapy and an approach. I don't, I'm not dogmatic on that, but so I think. Uh, Do you, uh, uh, let me interrupt. Um, do you see the same, what pattern do you see in Dante in terms of his life and his work? What is the relationship between them? Well, it's more obvious, I think, in La Vita Nuova, mm -hmm. where he has that remarkable dream at very young age, that's like his beloved is like being fed his heart. I mean, it's like an acid dream or something. I mean, the, 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 you know, I think it's in sort of a high relief in that book. But it's also just the intensity. I see it also in the motion. Motions, people like they're, 
you know, you can study people who are disturbed and upset and the way they move, the way they rock. There's a part of the brain, if you don't get emotional balance, if you're not handled as a child, people grow up and they're rocking all the time, trying to get the kind of caressing they never got as a child. So the motion, there was another question about motion. Mm -hmm. And I think in Dante, the motion is the people who were too lazy and, and didn't use time efficiently, they're forced to rush around like crazy. You know, there in the in purgatory, there's a lot of stuff. Somebody just mentioned it. I think maybe it was David about looking up to the heavens or being shoved to look at the ground. Or there's constant motion. Once you start to see it, you see it everywhere. You see the staging of it and the lighting effects and the motions and the blocking. What people call the mise en scène in theater, the whole pattern of movement and even costumes and colors and and palettes and it's it's all kind of there. I think that's why. Dante was such an influence, even on the silent movie makers. He had a big impact on them because I think of the movement in the work. And he talks about he goes around a curve and the spheres are moving the planets and it's a certain hour of the day and suddenly an angel appears that makes the sun look dim and he, he has, it forces his head to the ground because the light is so bright. Uh, and so this going to the ground, going to the heavens, like in Tai Chi, where you're blending heaven and earth, mm -hmm. it's constantly happening in Dante, trying to reconcile the demands of heaven and the realities of earth, the attractions of the earth versus the call of heaven. And those are motions. Almost every etymology, people, someone else mentioned the word, if you look at it, there's a movement at the root of our most sophisticated words. If you break them down and look at the etymologies, there's almost always physical movement or posture involved. Mm -hmm. you know? Wonderful. Um, Peter, what do you think about suffering and artists? I think that I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna oversimplify and go with the, the, with the, the keeps here, this idea of truth being beauty and beauty being truth, that outside of any kind of ideal, or even what we like, artists are able to find a way to articulate what is real, however ugly, however uncomfortable, however horrifying, to the point where we are able to resonate, if we can see it in their work, something that hasn't been given acknowledgement, shape, or form, or at least the kind of form that they gave it. It gives us clarity in one form or another to something that is deep within us. And beauty can be terrifying. We don't have to like beauty, but it is there is still the catharsis of facing what is true. And to me, the truth is beyond any type of good or evil. It's beyond any type of, uh, you know, a sacred or profane. It's just what is. And so it is we find a way to relate to it once it is seen but to see it to have light be shed on it is the fundamental motion of building relationship and to me that's what however the kind of artist that is their courage to find a way to shed light on it given a medium okay um uh, maxine the question is what is the connection between great art and suffering do you think there is any connection or no connection I know what the question is, and um, all art is connected to suffering, but it isn't exactly suffering. It's called sensitivity. So um, when you have like a Van Gogh, he cut off his ear. Um, we have Beethoven who went mad. Half the composers went mad, but they all had something that they had to get out of their system and express it. And the only way they could express it was in some kind of an art form. Uh, great actors, they're all mad. Uh, great musicians, composers, um, even um, the the modern music artists of today. I mean, you see that their problems, um, they are mad, but the more mad they are, the more talented they are. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, next up is, uh, Doug, did you have anything? 
Well, I did want to add a brief note. I think that the sensitivity is a good word. And in theater in this country, if you go to college and study theater, the most sensitive artists are usually out of theater within six months after they graduate because they can't take the nature of the business here in the US and the lack of support for that sensitivity. Uh, and I, that's just a personal note. Thank you. Uh, of how quickly those people vanish. And the stamina it takes if you have the sensitivity to push through. Some people can do that. Some people have both. Um, Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, what do you think about suffering and art? We have to be very brief. I can definitely think it, uh, it may amplify their sense as a way to express themselves. I mean, I think of uh, Robin Williams, you know, great comic. Uh, you found out, and Bruce Springsteen suffered with bouts of depression. So they may be so severely off balance that maybe that's, they're more in tune with how to express them, or maybe it's simply that's how they have to, that's therapy for them. Thank you. you. Know, uh, next up is Allison, followed by Madeline. Allison. Um, I don't think you can cre create great art unless you're somebody who feels really deeply. Because, um, I mean, some people feel more deeply than others do. Some people tend to be pretty middle of the road most of the time. But those people usually aren't great artists because you have to be able to feel something to be able to put it on a stage or on painting or in words. And if you're not capable of feeling it, then you can't. You know, um, but but Doug, I do agree with you. I was a dancer and went to many cattle call auditions, and you have to have like nerves of steel in order to uh, deal with that audition process. Mm -hmm. Like you may feel really deeply, but you just you just shut it off and you go into like it's like combat zone or something. You know, like Wonderful. it's hard to explain. Uh, yeah. Next up is Madeline. Uh, yes, here is the choice. The intellect of man is forced to choose perfection of the life or of the work. And if it take the second, meaning art, must refuse a heavenly mansion raging in the dark. When all that story's finished, what's the news? In luck or out, the toil has left its mark. That old perplexity and empty purse or the day's vanity the night's remorse. That's a Yeats poem called The Choice. Mm. Very nice, very nice. Um, all right, folks. So this was uh, wonderful and uh, just uh, incredible, incredible discussion. Um, in about uh, nine minutes, we are going to start another meetup on the long childhood. Um, basically, it is about the idea of what sets human beings apart and the role of curiosity, role of remaining kind of open to the world throughout your life. Um, and Victor Branowski is one of the biggest, one of the best and the most, he has done the most eloquent statement about that. Uh, even if you have not uh, watched the video, I'm, I'm gonna be just talking about all the themes and there are gonna be many, many people who have watched the video, who will be commenting as well. So I invite you to stay. Um, we will restart in about a couple of minutes. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everybody. Cool. Could I say one thing? Please Just go ahead. Thing. Go ahead. Uh, I found out about during this meeting uh, that Buckminster Fuller's daughter, Allegra Fuller Snyder, passed away. Uh, tomorrow actually is her father's birthday. And she was a dancer and she headed the UCLA dance department for 25 years. And we've been talking about movement and dance. And uh, she was an incredible presence who really personified love and movement uh, in her life. And I just sort of wanted to mention that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. All right, folks.